My name is Chaim Angel, and I'm dedicating this introductory shiur of Tehillim to the health of Sarah Lamb Dratch. May God protect her and all others who are ill, and thank you all for being part of this beautiful project in her honor. To summarize the principles of learning Tehillim that have been developed over the past 2,000 years in just two minutes, so that way we can have an introductory shiur, let us assume the following, as our Parshanut for many years has finally developed these concepts. First of all, all the Psalms that are in the Book of Tehillim are assumed to be written Beruach HaKodesh. They are not just religious poetry, but rather something binding, compelling in a religious sense on our souls. The second thing is that Psalms were written throughout the biblical period according to various midrashim. They were written from the time of Adam all the way till the time of Ezra, one of the last characters in Tanakh. Psalms could have been written at one time triggered by an event, or they could have been written over many centuries developed and edited in order to create what becomes a precursor to the Siddur itself. We don't know what, if any, events triggered a particular mizmor in most cases, nor is that really what is essential. What matters when we are learning Tehillim and reading them is what the prayers mean, what they meant in their original context, and what they can mean to us. The theme of this introductory shiur is how psalms can transform in meaning themselves, and also how they can transform our souls. We're going to look very briefly at just two psalms, Psalm 6 and Psalm 30. For the benefit of the public, I'm going to read them in English, but of course, if you are familiar with the Hebrew, you may follow along inside a Siddur or a Book of Psalms or any Tanakh. Psalm 6 is a very short one. It is read by many Ashkenazic communities on a daily basis as the Tachanun prayer. And it goes like this. For the leader, with instrumental music on the Sheminit, a Psalm of David. O Lord, do not punish me in anger. Do not chastise me in fury. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I languish. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones shake with terror. My whole being is stricken with terror, while you, Lord, oh, how long? O Lord, turn, rescue me, deliver me as befits your faithfulness. For there is no praise of you among the dead in Sheol who can acclaim you. I am weary with groaning. Every night I drench my bed. I melt my couch in tears. My eyes are wasted by vexation worn out because of all my foes. Away from me, all you evildoers, for the Lord heeds the sound of my weeping. The Lord heeds my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be frustrated and stricken with terror. They will turn back in an instant, frustrated. It's amazing how this psalm has a transition within it, as many psalms do. For the majority, the psalmist is incredibly miserable, seems to be suffering both physically and mentally, over what appears to be an illness, although there is also mention of enemies. Suddenly in verse 9, when the psalmist yells at all the evildoers to go away, for God hears me, suddenly there's a transition to verse 10, which says, The Lord heeds my plea, the Lord accepts my prayer. Our commentators are baffled. What exactly changed so that the psalmist went from being despondent, miserable, crying on his couch, to all of a sudden feeling that God is with him and will save him. Ibn Ezra suggests the possibilities that either the psalmist actually was healed, meaning that verses 1 through 8 or 1 through 9 were written while the psalmist was ill, and that after he got better, he went on to write the, the few verses of gratitude at the end. It's also possible, given that we are in Tanakh, that the psalmist was inspired divinely, that there was some kind of prophetic revelation so that the psalmist realized that he would be saved by God. And so he therefore expressed gratitude even before physically getting better. Radak suggests, alternatively, that yes, these possibilities exist, but it's also possible that the psalmist wrote the psalm not because of any physical illness of himself, but rather because people get ill. And as a result, he wrote this psalm so that people could have something to pray from when they themselves got ill. But he agrees fundamentally with Ibn Ezra that most of the psalm is a petition, please God heal me. Mi'iri, a third commentator in this mix, argues differently based on this flow. He says that in fact the entire psalm was written after the psalmist healed, or at least it's written as a prayer of gratitude for one who has been healed. The first eight or nine verses are a flashback to 
the conditions of illness that the psalmist experienced, but in fact the entire psalm is saying, thank you God, this is how I suffered back in the day, but now I am already healed, so thank you. A fourth possibility exists, however, besides those suggested by our Rishonim, by even Ezra, Radak, and Meiri, and that is put forth by Amos Chacham in his Dat Mikra commentary. He argues that it's quite possible that the entire psalm is from the perspective of somebody who is still ill, and this person has not been healed yet, and this person has not gotten any divine inspiration saying that he will be healed. But what's the meaning of the transition? That when you pray, you're opening your heart. You're opening your soul to God. And by doing that, you feel for the first time that you're not alone. Very often people who are ill, who are suffering in one form or another, whether physically or mentally or both, they feel completely isolated from the world, even if they are surrounded by people who are, who love them, who care for them. But one feels very, why is God doing this to me? Praying, among other things, helps cure that, not by necessarily healing the illness right away, but by enabling one to feel God's presence. And Amos Chacham quotes a Mishnah in Brachot 34b, that it was related of Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, that he used to pray for the sick and say, this one will die and this one will live. People asked him, how do you know? He replied, if my prayer comes out fluently, I know that it was accepted. If not, then I know it was rejected. Regardless of the holy man status of Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, Amos Chacham in the Dat Mikra commentary understands that this Mishnah is teaching that when we pray and we feel right about praying, then suddenly we feel differently. Whether or not there's a healing process yet in play, but we feel that God is with us. And that transforms the psalmist from a mood of misery, being despondent, crying, to suddenly feeling, God is with me. I'm okay. However things turn out, I know that I'm in God's hands. And often this happens within Tehillim, that within a single mizmor you find a psalmist going from being terrified, miserable, alone, to feeling that God is with him because he prayed. And that's one layer of transformation that we find constantly within the book of Psalms. Our next psalm that we will consider is Psalm 30, which most, most Jews recite on a daily basis in the liturgy. The Psalm of David, a psalm for the dedication of the house. I extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up, and not let my enemies rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from Sheol, preserved me from going down into the pit. O you faithful of the Lord, sing to him, and praise his holy name. For he is angry but a moment, and when he is pleased, there is life. One may lie down weeping at nightfall, but at dawn there are shouts of joy. The first half of this psalm is one of gratitude. Clearly the psalmist is describing a situation where either one was saved from illness or enemies or both. Commentators have different approaches to how to bridge the enemies and illness theme within the psalm. You could argue that the psalmist is describing a physical illness and when one is ill there are enemies who rejoice and so when the psalmist or the individual heals then the enemies are thwarted in that sense. Alternatively, perhaps the psalmist is describing a military problem with real physical enemies, and the illness is a metaphor for these enemies. A third possibility, of course, is that this psalm was not written for any one circumstance, but rather was written as a psalm of gratitude for one being saved from any type of woe, whether illness or enemies, or later on we hear about mourning. And that seems to be the most likely interpretation of the verse and basically of the psalm, according to Amos Chacham in the Dat Mikra. There's also a transition within this psalm, and that brings us to the second half, where the psalmist flashes back to the earlier period before there was even any woe at all. Starting with verse 7, when I was untroubled, I thought, I shall never be shaken, for you, O Lord, when you were pleased, made me firm as a mighty mountain. When you hid your face, I was terrified. I called to you, O Lord. To my Lord I made appeal. What is to be gained from my death, from my descent into the pit? Can dust praise you? Can it declare your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. O Lord, be my help. You turned my lament into dancing. You undid my sackcloth and girded me with joy, that my whole being might sing hymns to you endlessly. O Lord my God, I will praise you forever. The second half 
opens up a window into the psalmist's soul, rather than just the tail end of the process where he already has been healed from his illness or saved from his enemies or both, we find out how the psalmist feels about pre-illness and pre-woe, where he says, you know, there was a time when everything was good and I took it for granted. I thought I would never be shaken. He was overconfident. Rather than saying, thank you, God, for day-to-day -day life when things are good, when there is peace, when there is health, Rather, he just took all of that for granted. Now he's regretting that, because then he got ill and suddenly realized he needed God for sustenance, for health, for healing. And then he called out to God and pleaded with him, so that by the end of the psalm, he's back to where he is now, which is, thank God, healed, better, rejoicing in God's salvation, but recognizing that he wants to teach the audience, those of us who are reading the psalm on a regular basis, that it's not just enough to say thank you when we are healed from illness. We also have to say thank you and recognize God's presence all the time, even when things are good. And this is a major element of the body of the psalm. There is one question, however, which commentators have been plagued by from time immemorial. If the psalm began at verse 2 and ended at the end of the psalm, we would have this spiritual journey that I've just described. But most of our commentators are very bothered by its opening verse, where it says, A Psalm of David, a song for the dedication of the house. Now, there are several difficulties with this. What house? The house sounds like the dedication of the first temple. Now, of course, King David did not build the first temple, nor was he alive at the dedication of the first temple. His son, King Solomon, built the temple, and King Solomon was present at the dedication of the house. So that's just very strange if a psalm of David refers to David's composing this mizmor, this psalm, and then being present at the dedication of the house. This simply did not happen. Second of all, the psalm seems to indicate that the, the psalmist was saved from a physical illness, whether actual illness or perhaps enemies. It does not sound like a metaphor at all. It also sounds like this salvation or this dedication process already has taken place. And this leads to a very difficult and thorny road throughout the history of Parshanut. In a brief introductory shiur, we will just summarize a couple of the major approaches. Rashi and Radak follow a long line of Talmudic texts that King David himself composed this psalm. He prophetically anticipated that the temple would be built. He prophetically anticipated that this building of the temple would to some degree exonerate him, or at least proclaim that he is righteous before God after the horrible episode of Bathsheba and Uriah outlined in the book of Shmuel, book of Samuel. And so he thanked God that he was very low, he felt spiritually miserable as a result of his sin, did not know if he still stood in God's presence. Prophetically anticipating the dedication of the temple, he realized that he had been forgiven by God, and this made him delightfully happy. And so that's the theme of the psalm according to Rashi and Radak. Several commentators, however, are very unsatisfied by this approach. After all, the psalm seems to be describing salvation from a physical hazard where somebody was at the brink of death rather than just mentally tormented. And therefore, even Ezra and Meiri, among others, suggest that even though most commentators understand a song for the dedication of the house, to mean the house with a capital H, Chanukah Tabayit, referring to the temple, that cannot be. King David was not at the dedication of the temple, and there was nothing about physical salvation there. And therefore, they understand that either he must have been ill and dedicated his own palace, meaning his house, or perhaps there was a closer connection, that, according to Meiri, that David was saved from his enemies, so he was unable to build his own palace, and after defeating his enemies, he was able to build his palace. So that is Chanukah Tabayit, the way we use the term. At the dedication of the palace, that's when David recited this psalm. It has nothing to do, according to them, with the temple. On the one hand, that's good because it creates some physical hazard that David encountered, and it also explains the connection between the opening verse and the body of the Mizmor, the body of the psalm, in a more coherent way. The downside is that Chanukah Tabayit really sounds much more like it has to do with the building of a temple rather than with the dedication of David's palace. Malbim, for example, in the 19th century is so dissatisfied with these earlier approaches that he suggests that the house here is a metaphor for David's body, that in fact David was physically ill 
and his body, which is the house of his soul, was in trouble. And when he healed from his illness, he therefore thanked God for healing him from his illness, which was the dedication of his metaphorical house, namely his body. This, of course, connects the Mizmor on a very fundamental level, but it also runs into the difficulty that Chanukata by it seems to be dedication of an actual physical structure. Probably the temple, perhaps, according to Ibn Ezra and Meiri, his palace, but not likely to refer to his actual body. And so we're left with a 1,000-year-old debate which is not adequately resolved, so much so that Amos Hacham in the 20th century in his Dat Mikra commentary simply says, Lo barur, I don't understand, it's not clear what verse 1 refers to. There are two additional approaches that one could posit, however, that might better explain the connection between verse 1 and the rest of the Mizmor, the rest of the psalm. One is how to translate the term Le David, or to David, or of David. Our commentators have long been aware that Le David, when it says Mizmor Shir Chanukat Habay Le David, Le David could mean that David wrote the psalm, but it also can mean that somebody else composed this psalm and dedicated it to David, like an ode to David. From this point of view, it could have been written by somebody in David's time, or a little bit after, or even considerably after. And so from that point of view, perhaps one could argue that this psalm was dedicated, was, was composed at the beginning of the Second Temple period, for example. And because the builders of the temple were so excited and, of course, looked at David as the founder of the Book of Psalms and also the one who prepared the way for the building of the first temple, it's quite possible that they said an ode to David. Thank you for saving us from our enemies, meaning the exile, the enemy is the Babylonians, and for allowing us to rebuild this temple. And from that point of view, the second temple builders are the ones who composed this psalm and dedicated the psalm to David. Perhaps the most intriguing way of dealing with verse 1 is suggested by Nahum Sarna in his book called On the Book of Psalms. Sarna suggests that there are several superscriptions, several introductory verses in Psalms, where it's not clear exactly what they mean. Just to give you a different example from Psalm 92, we recite Mizmor Shir, Chanukata, no, Mizmor Shir Li Yom HaShabbat. It's a song for the, for the Shabbat. The question goes like this. When this psalm was written originally, was it written to be sung in the temple on Shabbat as the Shir Shel Yom, as the psalm of the day? Or was the song composed independent of Shabbat? And then at a later period, it was introduced as the liturgy on Shabbat in the temple. And then somebody else added the introductory verse to say, this is when this psalm is read, as opposed to this is why this psalm was composed. Perhaps the same thing is true with Mizmor Shir Hanukata by Le David here in Psalm 30. It's possible that King David or some other writer composed the psalm originally out of gratitude for being saved from an illness or from enemies. But then in a later period, at the building of the Second Temple, it could be that the builders said, this psalm applies to us as a nation. It's not just about the individual getting healed from a sickness, but this applies to us all. Now that we have been saved from the exile and are building the temple, we have, in fact, are feeling the same gratitude that David felt or that this psalmist felt upon being healed from an illness or from individual enemies. From this point of view, the psalm could have initially been Mizmor le David, nothing more than that. And in, at a later period, Mizmor Shir Chanukata Bay le David, Shir Chanukata Bay were added to explain the new application of an old psalm to a new circumstance. In both Psalm 6 and Psalm 30, there is a transition from the woe of the individual in this case, illness, enemies, or both, to a national feeling, a feeling that I'm not alone, not only that I have allowed God to enter me, but that I am connecting further to a community. Both Psalm 6 does this in its last verses, and Psalm 30 does this in its introductory verse, according to the reading of Nachum Sarna. What do we learn from these two psalms and from so many others that do the same thing? The first is that through reading Tehillim, we transform. We are opening our hearts and our souls and allowing God to come in. As soon as we do that, we're not the same as the person who prayed or the person that we were before we prayed. A second thing that happens when we pray is that we might often start as an individual. We're talking about one person's illness. 
one person's woes, one person's gratitude from being healed or being saved from those difficult times. But then we start to feel part of a community. We realize that other people have woes. Other people are likewise praying for salvation and other people likewise are thankful to God for daily sustenance and for their personal miracles. And that's when we become a commu covenantal community. And we're able to feel each other's pain and each other's joy through the Psalms. We're able to come together and bond as a community. And this is exactly what happens in this series on Tehillim. We're so, so deeply concerned about Sarah Lam Dratch. May God heal her and give her a rifuash lema, that we are bonding together as a community. We start with her, the individual, but before you know it, we're thinking about a broader community. And this is exactly what Sarah has been telling everybody when they ask, what can we do to help? And the answer is that she gives, do more mitzvot, learn, do acts of chesed. That's exactly the right response to any crisis. Of course we pray, of course we go to the doctor and do undergo whatever treatments are necessary. And simultaneously, as a community, we come together doing more mitzvot, feeling a greater sense of solidarity for this one individual and for one another. And that's all part of the process of learning and reading Tehillim. Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik defined this very well in his Fate and Destiny. He described that there are two responses to crisis. One is that of fate, where one asks, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to us? That is a failed response for the simple reason that we don't understand how God works. We don't understand why there is suffering. We don't understand why individuals get ill. We don't understand why communities very often suffer the way that they do. Asking the question of why did this happen to me or to us is the response of fate. It is a losing battle because we will just be frustrated with God and never understand the answer anyway. A community of destiny understands that the question that we ask is, what do we do, given the circumstances that we don't understand, what can we do to improve ourselves and our community? And this is exactly what Sarah Lamb Dratch has asked of each one of us. And this is what all the people who are responding by giving of their time to create Shirim online. And those who are following these Shirim, reading Tehillim, praying for Sarah, praying for so many others who are ill, this is what we are all doing because this is the proper halachic and Jewish response to all forms of crisis. The learning of Psalms is in Sarah Lam Drach's Zechut. We pray and hope for her refuash lema, full healing, recovery. And at the same time, we come together as a religious community. We realize that this is a way to transform our own souls and open our own souls to God. And at the same time, to open ourselves to one another so that we could bond as a covenantal community. May God bless Sarah. May God bless all of the participants in this program. And God bless all of us in the community. May our learning of Sefer Tehillim transform all of us and bond us into a religious community. May God grant health and healing to Sarah, to those who are ill in our people and beyond, that ultimately, God willing, we will continue to lead to Helim and reach greater heights in the community through acts of learning, through acts of chesed, all in the zechut of Sarah Lamdrach. Refuah Shlema, and thank you.